Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to our St. Bridget's Day Festival. In this program, you're going to hear from women of the diaspora who all live in Vancouver. For centuries, Bridget's life and legends have inspired and given strength to the women of Ireland. Today, these women will speak of their experiences, their history, and most of all, their very personal memories of Ireland. Our love of Ireland has sustained us in our lives here in Vancouver. It is the thread that links us all. Irish women share in the collective soul of Ireland and feel the need to talk about their history in that ancient land. To begin this program, since St. Bridget is also the patron saint of poetry, I would like to share a poem from one of Ireland's most beloved female poets, the late Ivan Boland. The immigrant Irish, like oil lamps, we put them out the back of our houses, of our minds. We had lights better then, newer then and now. A time came, this time and now, we need them, their dread makeshift example. They would have thrived on our necessities. What they survived, we could not even live. By their light, now it is time to imagine how they stood there, what they stood with, that their possessions may become our power. Hardboard, iron, and their hardships parceled in them. Patience, fortitude, long suffering in the bruised, colored dusk of the new world and all the old songs and nothing left to lose. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce Una Berry, our first reader. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Um, I was uh, born in Dublin in 1938. In 1959, I left Ireland and went to London where I lived, worked and married and had three children. In 1968, when I was 30, we came to Canada, the country that I now call home. My piece today is a few memories about my Catholic upbringing, beginning with a poem I wrote a few years ago. The Kiss. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I've told lies. I tease my brothers and sisters. I forgot my morning prayers. I committed adultery. I heard his intake of breath behind the grill. With a married man, he hissed. No, I replied, he's only 17. You mean you had intercourse? Yes, father, I suppose so. For penance, say three, three rosaries, and if you come again with a mortal sin, there will be no absolution. Now, an act of contrition. Yes, Father, I whispered. Shamefully, I intoned the words, Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee. Stumbling out of the confessional, I prayed I was not pregnant. His tongue had not entered my mouth. My piece today is called Imaginary Friends. A Jungian analyst once remarked that despite having been educated by nuns throughout my entire schooling, I was the only Irish person he had met who appeared totally unaffected by a Catholic upbringing. Both in his role of priest and analyst, he had seen many recovering Irish Catholics. I was three years of age when I started going to Mass and saying night prayers. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph became a part of my life at an early age, if nothing else but as swear words. Alongside the telling of fairy tales and ghost stories, we were also encouraged to say prayers every night. My mother was a wishy-washy Catholic, so we only got the bare minimum of religious instruction at home. Prayers at night were just in case. A few weeks before she died, I asked her why she had a priest give her communion. Her answer, just in case. 
prayers consisted of, say, asking God to take care of mom, dad, brothers and sisters, and ending up with myself. I went to Mass every Sunday and holy days of obligation until I was 16. I confessed my sins every week. During Lent, I would attempt to give up eating sweets and attend Mass before school. I never managed either for more than a week. I sang in the school choir where, along with folk songs and lullabies, we practiced singing masses for special occasions in the convent chapel. Occasionally, we would join with other choirs and sing in the local parish church. I loved those high masses, but my favorite service of all was the short benediction one of the most sensual of all Catholic church traditions. Incense, candles, singing, the priests adorned in ornate white vestments trimmed with gold. No matter how decrepit he was, he looked like an ancient Greek god. It was pure magic. Masses were said or sung in Latin, so the word, never interfered with my dreaming. I had no idea what any of it meant. Jesus, God, were imaginary friends and like the ghosts and goblins of fairy tales, never seemed real. The result was that the church rarely interfered with our daily life, aside from the Angelus that reminded us to stop and reflect. It was announced by the bell ringer at noon and 6 p.m. We would then stop whatever we were doing, bow our heads, say a brief prayer and be on our way. I still love that idea as I do the lighting of candles to remember a friend or family member. My friend Wendy and I would sneak into the local church, light candles and pray to St. Anne to find us a man as fast as you can. Wendy was Protestant, so when one of my teachers found out I had a Protestant friend, she expressed concern and told me to pray for her conversion. I never did, and she, as far as I know, never converted. Unlike most of my classmates who had to kneel every night and recite the family rosary, we never did, nor did we say morning prayers. A teacher in one of my junior classes asked who didn't recite the family rosary every night. I was the only one who put up her hand. She asked me why, but I couldn't tell her. At a very early age, I felt different. Dad was an Irish atheist, meaning he always left the door slightly open so that when he finally got into AA, he lapped up the spiritual side of it. His father, my grandfather, was a practicing Catholic until he died, and my grandmother converted from Anglicanism to Catholicism and became more Catholic than Catholic. In my early teens, I expressed an interest in becoming a nun. My grandfather was very happy and invited a couple of nuns to meet with me. My father was outraged and told me in no uncertain turn words over my dead body. Like my Lent endeavors, that desire only lasted a very short time. Oh, I just want to say something. These two were one of my main reasons for leaving Ireland. And if you don't know who they are, just grab an Irish elder and they'll tell you. I had many arguments with dad about religion during those early teenage years. And even for a brief moment in time, argued the case for God. I never won that argument. Dad ended our heated discussions by reminding me of the Inquisition. His best drinking buddy was the parish priest and I would think they had similar discussions and disagreements. Nevertheless, to this day, I am very grateful to my dad as he encouraged, in fact, insisted that we question everything and everyone, 
including himself. I made my first confession and first communion when I was seven. I still recall feeling scared the night before that first confession. What if I had committed a mortal sin? What would the priest say? Next day, I went into the dark confessional, like a little hut it was, where a shadowy figure, the priest, sat behind a mesh grill as I confessed to forgetting my prayers, teasing my siblings, disobeying my parents, etc. For penance, I was given three Hail Marys and absolved of all my sins for that week. The same sins confessed each week, the same penance given each week until I was 16. My last confession was the day I confessed to adultery having kissed my first boyfriend. The priest queried the status of the man, and when he heard he was 17 years of age, told me it was intercourse. He gave me three rosaries as penance and told me there would be no absolution if I repeated that sin. My first communion day was equally traumatic and an omen of things to come as my fail fell off at the altar rails just as I raised my head to receive communion, the body of Christ. At school, I was top of my, at school, I was top of my class in religious knowledge. We had weekly tests and I won a number of holy pictures of the Virgin Mary, Saint Teresa, or some other equally well-known saint. If I was very lucky, a bar of chocolate. When I made my confirmation, I was told to sit at the end of a pew in case Archbishop McQuaid, there he is, the officiator, asked a knowledge question. Sure enough, he did. I can't remember the question, but I do remember him stroking my cheek. A sort of blessing, or was it? After years of endless discussion and exploration on the pros and cons of believing in God, I finally reached my age of reason and ditched all imaginary friends. However, having said that, I find myself in times of despair muttering those deeply ingrained words, Dear God, please help me. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce Sharon. Thank you, Una. My name is Sharon Brown and I was born in Quebec City, one of six children. My mother, Nora, was raised in Belfast. The story I'm going to read is about my mother's paternal Aunt Nellie, someone whose existence my mother was never quite sure about. This piece is a tribute to my great aunt Nellie and it's called Factory Girl. But before I read it, I'd like to read a poem by Christopher Levinson entitled The Ward, St. Walston's TB Hospital, 1953. Converted from their wartime use, the barrack wards breed silence, build a prison of rest. Winter outside, starchy whiteness within, patrolled by nurses. Bill lay there, reading, listless, long scars across his back, where first a third of one lung had been excised, then two thirds of the other. At night, only a radio's muted hum to staunch the darkness. Next to a photo of his wife, he'd scrawled a line from Seneca. The first step to the cure is desiring to be cured. The pumps still drained him. The blood toiled in his chest, but he did not make it. One morning, his bed was empty. No farewells from his mates on the ward. Only the changed white sheet. 
In January of 2021, just before presenting a piece at the Bridget Festival about my mother's journey between Ireland and Canada, I discovered to my surprise and delight a cousin living in White Rock, some 35 kilometers from myself in Vancouver. Her grandmother and my maternal grandfather were brother and sister. We had never met before. This meeting led me on an odyssey backwards through time into discoveries about my mother's family that I had been unaware of for over 60 years. My cousin, luckily for us, happened to be the family historian and shared a wealth of information on my maternal side of the family. <clears throat> my maternal grandfather had a brother and two sisters. Our family never heard of the existence of his brother for many years and only heard vague references about his two sisters. This story is about his youngest sister, Nellie, whose short life ended from a debilitating disease at the age of 20. Nellie was born Ellen Greer in 1898 in Belfast, Ireland. From any gleam of information collected on her family life, she was born into poverty. Her parents, my great-grandparents, died two years apart, both at the age of 39. Her father died in August of 1901, her mother in December of 1903. At the time of their mother's death, the children were 11, 9, 7, and 5 years of age. Nellie was the five-year-old. When their mother died, all the children were taken in by their paternal grandparents. The grandmother died in 1908, the grandfather the following year. The children remained in Ireland with aunts and uncles and the 1911 census of Ireland shows them still living with these relatives. However, at some point during 1911, a decision was made that would alter their lives forever. The two teenage girls, Nellie at 13 and her sister Minnie at 17 years of age would leave Ireland with their aunt Ellen to live in Canada with another relative. Apparently, aunt Ellen had intended to stay in Canada with them to work as a domestic, but something changed her mind and she ended up going back to Belfast and lived there until her death. Imagine the turmoil for these four children moved around from grandparents to aunts and uncles and then separated. The two boys remaining in Ireland, their two sisters shipped off to Canada. I try to visualize Nellie's short tragic life with the loss of both parents at an early age, then shunted from one relative to another, one country to another. I find it hard to absorb all her losses. I'm not aware of the exact timeline or her age when she had to seek employment in Winnipeg, but she must have been fairly young, maybe 17 or so. <clears throat> at some point in her working life, she lived at 418 Toronto Street in Winnipeg, as shown by the house in my images. She managed to secure a job in a garment factory and I tried to trace the history of this industry in Manitoba with very little success, probably because the factories employed predominantly women workers. I found a 1987 article by an historian on the Winnipeg garment industry, 1900 to 1955, but found there were so many factories during this period, it would be difficult to nail down the one that Nellie worked in. From 1900 to 1920, there were 72 buildings used as factories scattered throughout the city. However, our family now believes she might have worked at the Monarch overall factory. Sometime in 1918, Nellie fell ill with pulmonary tuberculosis, very likely from working at the garment factory. Tuberculosis is an airborne bac bacteria that infects the lungs and forms tuber-like growths. In the same year, Nellie was sent for treatment to Nanette Sanatorium, 
which was situated near the community of Nanette, about 20, 225 kilometers from Winnipeg. This facility was established in 1909 and administered to house and care for those living with TB. At the time, effective treatments were not available. Patients were isolated from the general public and prescribed rest and good nutrition. That's all there was at the time. Today, TB is easily treated with antibiotics. During the course of my research, I discovered that about 40 years or so later in 1962-63, a tuberculosis outbreak referred to then as the tuberculosis explosion at Eskimo Point in the Northwest Territories resulted in at least 80 Inuit being sent to Nanette Sanatorium for treatment. Many of them children, separated from their families over long periods of time. Through various sources, I came across some information that in 2018, some indigenous survivors were preparing for class action lawsuits over the horrific abuse and torture they experienced at the hands of medical staff at so-called Indian hospitals and sanatoriums. There are many stories from survivors about the physical, sexual, and emotional ill treatment suffered at this particular facility and other establishments. I wanted to mention this painful situation in light of all the recent narratives in the media on the appalling conduct towards Aboriginal people and how I stumbled across a connection with this same sanatorium that my great aunt died in. As a white woman, her ministrations would have been vastly different. Nellie spent over nine months in the sanatorium and must have been exceedingly lonely as her one consolation in life, her one comfort, was having her sister Minnie living just south of Winnipeg. However, not only the distance would have been too great, great for any visits, but TB patients are kept segregated, so a visit would seem unlikely. Nevertheless, the two sisters did communicate, and two pages of two letters from Nellie to her sister Minnie have survived. I'd like to read from these extracts. Sanatorium Nanat, Manitoba, February 7th, 1919. Dear Minnie, here we are again, and I received your letter okay, and I am glad that you are keeping well, as this leaves me not too bad at the present time, but there's one thing. I am feeling very much better than the last time I wrote you. So you have Jack back home again with you. I hope this cold is better by now. What do you mean you will be in your own place this spring? Aren't you in your own place now? Or where the deuce are you anyway? I always understood that you were in your own home. Where are you anyway? March 7, 1919. <clears throat> Dear Minnie, just a card to let you know I received your letter some time ago, but have been very ill since last writing you. So that was the delay in answering. I am feeling much better today, thank God. Hope you are fine yourself. Oh yes, I have some news. Mary had another young son, March 4th. Arthur sent me a card and told me. He says that Susan and Ernest are real proud of him. Poor Susan, she will have something to do now. I tell you, love from Sis Nell, Nellie. It was the last known letter that Nellie wrote to her sister. She died only a month later on April 11, 1919. According to her death certificate, she was 20 years, 11 months, and five days old. Thank you. And now over to Mari Bruce. Thank you, Sharon. Oh dear, what a sad tale. Um, I, uh, good morning, everybody. I call this saga the next installment of my life as an immigrant living in Vancouver for over 50 years. 
Strangely, I still call Ireland home, but Canada is where I live. I grew up in County Kildare, Ireland on a dairy farm and immigrated to Vancouver in 1967 at the age of 23. I had a yen for travel and adventure. Uh, I wanted a new life with freedoms from the old ways and traditions. I thought I was very well qualified to find a decent job in the city. I worked in Dublin for a Supreme Court judge and had glowing references extolling my skills, which proved to be useless in my job search. I spent a month in Vancouver job hunting and wearing out my welcome, staying with acquaintances. My money was running low and I had no luck finding a job. The old refrain, you have no Canadian experience. By chance, I met a guy at the Devonshire bar who suggested I should go up to Whistler, a newly opened ski resort. They would be hiring for the ski season. Whistler at that time was very remote and difficult to reach, but I managed to get a ride up there. I did get a job working as a chambermaid in Highland Lodge. I was the first Irish girl there, and there were only three lodges in the resort. The very first night there, I went to Chequemus Bar, and I met my future husband, George Bruce, a Scottish ski patroller. It was love at first sight, a very romantic and profound meeting of kindred spirits, and eventually we married. We, uh, we lived in for 44 years in two houses my entire married life. Um, a very stable, secure life, surrounded by my family, three children, a garden and a cat. George was a very keen outdoorsy man. He did the, ground, the grouse grind twice a week. And on the 18th of January, 2011, he left early to lead a hike for the West Van Seniors. At 11 a.m. that morning, I got an emergency call to go to the Lionsgate Hospital. My heart turned to stone and I knew something was very wrong. George dropped dead on the Lynn Valley Trail on the 19th of January 2011. He was only 67 years old and it was always my worst nightmare that he would die and leave me alone. I was stunned and shattered to my core and what followed in these notes are various ways I was learning to cope and continue my life in some tolerable way. It was a year of grieving and loss, a year alone, my first in 46 years. The first three months, the pain was intense, sore, hurting and uncompromising. I stayed close to home. I read grieving books. I prayed and I watched TV. I couldn't process thought or concentrate. Invitations came and went. Sometimes I accepted a walk but not coffee shops, which I enjoyed in the past, but now I avoided them. On sunny days, I went into the garden and I noticed weeds and perennials gone wild. I spent a couple of hours, but my heart was not in it. Several months passed before I could bring myself to garden again. I went to church most morning and I felt safe there. My out of town children brought me comfort. My two sons watched over me and called me every day. My daughter expected results. She encouraged me to join life again, exercise, meet friends and keep busy. I was busy. I was learning to pay e-bills, deal with banks, transfer home funds into my name. I made a new will and appointed to a power of attorney. I went to the doctor. In fact, I went to several doctors to check my ailing body. I was recovering from a three bone break in my ankle and my blood pressure was high. I avoided big groups. I felt closed and private and unable to share myself. I needed to find a new centre and try and come to terms with my new reality. I was not ready for the world. George's death changed everything in my life, my family, my dreams and my future. I had survived the first year. I limped along, going by instinct and accepting my pain. I never fought it or tried to mask it. There was just no point. Death is final and absolute. One has to accept that death would come to all of us. For me, it was a nightmare that George should die suddenly at 67. Two years on and still sad and struggling. I realize I'm a different person now, but the pain of my loss was easing. Some days were better than others. 
In my head, I knew I would have to downsize and clear out the house of 40 years of family living. I knew for my own well-being, I should do some form of exercise. I was in this limbo state when I heard of a beginner bike group starting at our local community. I decided to give it a try. It was years since I biked. My old bike was gathering dust and rust in the corner of the garden shed. It got a basic overhaul and I was roadworthy. The first day out, only five people showed up. We did a longish bike ride, mostly on bike paths, and I was exhilarated to be out in the elements. It rained and it felt so good to be on a bike. I continued riding every week with this group all spring. We did two bike trips, one to Victoria and one to La Paz Island. The more trip and more trips were planned for the future. I read recently that biking can be a spiritual experience and I have to agree. My, my spirits soar when I whiz along and recognize trees in bloom, the smell of the plants and earth and the sound of birdsong. My passion for travel returned and I was starting to hunt for bike trips to Europe. As I became fitter, I, I cast around for a weekend group. I wanted to ride on Saturdays, the weekend still being my most lonely time. A friend of mine knew of such a group and one wet Saturday morning I drove to the meeting spot in Burnaby. There were groups of people milling around cars and loading bikes and I joined them. They were called the psychopaths and Donna was our fearless leader. Uh, we biked to Granville Island and I was hooked. It was a struggle at first and I walked my bike up steep hills, but I was undeterred and showed up rain or shine because I knew this would be the start of the next stage of my life. After Saturday biking, we went to the pub for lunch. I was back in the world again, a very different world, but I was learning from my bike group. Everybody has a story. This is just the start of the sense of aliveness I felt because I found biking. It was also around this time I found the energy to start the process of downsizing and all that entails. I sold the house and squeezed myself and my possessions into a small apartment. I loved apartment living despite the loss of a garden. Another stage of my life had begun. From that time onward, miracles happened in my life. My children all settled down. They bought houses in Vancouver Island and then grandchildren appeared, all five of them in quick succession. My joy was tinged with sadness that George didn't live to see them. My daughter had a miracle first baby called Karis. Granny was the role I was meant to play in life. The joy and fun I've had with these children knows no bounds. I know their favorite foods and books. I enjoy, I involve them in my baking and gardening projects. Grandchildren are miracles in life and a chance to enjoy the fun and wonder of small children. Then I started to uh, plan for more travel while I could. The fo what follows is a travel log of some of the bike trips I took to Europe. I always loved France and twice I biked and barged to the glories of Burgundy and the famous wine vineyards. Then the following year I biked to the forest of Fontainebleau and into Paris and on to the villages where the French Impressionists painted. We made a detour to visit the grave of Vincent van Gogh and his brother Theo in the village of auvers roise One of my favorite bike trips was in China. We were visiting Xi'an on our way back from seeing the amazing terracotta army and panda bears. The ancient city of Xi'an is a fascinating place. 800 years ago, it was the start of the Silk Road. We hired bikes and rode on the wall above the ancient city as the sun was setting in a ball of red. Um, it was exotic and memorable with stunning views of pagodas and temples and an all-time memorable ride. I biked with my friend Bonnie in Vietnam. We biked through the rice paddies. When Bonnie met her Waterloo at a very sharp turn and went head over heels into the paddy. She wasn't hurt, but she was covered with mud and rice. We had to hose her down and fell, then fell about laughing. Every trip I took, I biked to, I wanted to bike. Many times I biked through Dublin and the traffic and out to Sandy Mount. I love biking through the Phoenix Park and onto Farmley for lunch. I had a very scary bike, a, a scary bike uh, leader in Hungary. 
we biked along the Danube and then, the, and then through the old city of Budapest, dodging traffic and people. <clears throat> Every so often we veered down back streets and thread through the traffic. My heart was in my mouth the whole time. I biked in Cuba with a group organized from Vancouver. This was the toughest trip for me, the intense heat, the steep hills, and a much younger, lycra-clad group from Germany. The bikes were old and heavy. We had a support van, and I was a frequent passenger to when the hills and the heat and the speed defeated me. I joined my local bike trip on yearly trips to Victoria on the Galloping Goose Trail and down to Laconor when the tulips are blooming. Then came COVID. The world changed for all of us and life took another more difficult twist. I had open heart surgery in 2021 and I decided I would have to move closer to my children who all live in Vancouver Island. I bought a townhouse in Comox which is in the middle of renovation as I write. A crazy venture at my age but it is close to my son and family. I am sad to be leaving a life here that I love with all the amenities, including the library, senior center, beach, churches, etc. Old age with all its twists and limitations is full of challenges, but we learn to cope and plow on, drawing on our years of experience and the paths we have to take. Thank you very much. Now I would like to introduce Maura De Freitas, a good friend, and uh, hello, Maura. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Um, my name is Maura De Freitas. Uh, some of you may know me as Maura McKay from my earlier incarnation as publisher of the Celtic Connection newspaper here in Vancouver. I'm a founding member of the Irish Benevolent Society of BC. And since 2020, I have been the festival director of the Bridget Festival Vancouver. Um, my story today is about my maternal family, and it's entitled, May the Light of Heaven Shine on the Souls of the Gales Who Left Ireland in the Years of the Great Famine. Nestled in the rolling hills of the Gatineau Valley in Western Quebec, just north of Canada's national capital, there's a little township that remains an enclave of Irish history entwined with French culture. I was raised here in this rural community among my mother's people. My father was from the north of Ireland, but my mother's ancestors arrived in Low Quebec as refugees from Ireland's great hunger. They settled in an area known as Martindale Parish, where they helped to build a new life. St. Martin de Tours Catholic Church became the heartbeat of the community. It was here that the passages of life were marked with marriages, baptisms, and funerals. The old adage of hatch, match, and dispatch were centered at the church. I can only imagine the challenges those families must have faced in those first few years. First, they survived the ravages of disease, along with the devastating famine at home in Ireland. Then they crossed the Atlantic on overcrowded vessels that became known as coffin ships. These were floating morgues with conditions that sent many passengers to a watery grave below. To say these people had a strong will to survive would be an understatement. They had experienced unknown horrors at home only to face the adversities of harsh Canadian winters. There was also the biting loneliness and sense of loss they must have experienced. These early settlers were buried just below the hill, south of the church in what was known as the old graveyard. In my generation, it had been abandoned for many years due to soil erosion, with a new cemetery established directly across from the church. <clears throat> the old graveyard is where my great, great grandparents, Martin Gannon and Mary Egan found their final resting place. They left their homeland in County Mayo in the year 1845, along with Mary's mother and her four siblings. Martin and Mary had eight children, and I am a descendant of their son, Patrick, known locally as Paddy Gannon. He married Anne Higgins, 
She was one of three sisters who married three Bannon brothers, Patty, Jimmy, and Thomas. I suppose there might have been few opportunities to meet new people in a small community, but it made for very close family relations on the Martin Bell Road. By the time I went to school, I was related to half the students there. Patty and Anne had five sons and five daughters, and my grandfather, Ambrose Gannon, was one of those children. He went on to be elected mayor of the township of Lowe following in the footsteps of his father, Patty Gannon. When my mother was 17 years old, she couldn't wait to leave the farm. So in 1953, she met my father who was fresh off the boat from County Tyrone at a dance in Toronto. After I was born, they decided to move back up to Gatineau to be closer to family. This is all background information for the story that I would like to share with you about an incident that occurred at the old graveyard, which left an indelible mark, not only on the whole community, but particularly on my own family. It dates to the early 1960s, when my mother, with three small children, was pregnant with a fourth child, and she was filled with dread. Earlier, she had contracted German measles and was aware of the fatal implications for both herself and her unborn child, who was at risk of severe birth defects with lifelong devastating consequences. The local doctor had informed her that this baby was unviable, but because she lived in Catholic Quebec, termination was impossible, regardless of the circumstances. As cruel as it would seem, she had no choice but to carry this baby to term and she wasn't sure if she could survive this ordeal. With no recourse, she started spending time in the old graveyard, communing with her ancestors. Many of the headstones were engraved with shamrocks and harps in memory of their homeland, but some of the names had worn away with time. Other stones had toppled over and were now covered in bramble. During this, these visits, she also became aware of the high number of infant and maternal mortality rates of those early settlers in the 1800s. Many young women and babies were buried in the old graveyard. Access to medical care was difficult due to the isolation. She told me how much this impacted her saying, at the time, I thought I was also going to die. In fact, I came very close to dying. So she started praying to her ancestors who had overcome so much hardship, asking for their help. She pledged to commit herself to restoring their burial ground if she could just survive this pregnancy and see her three small children grow to adulthood. In the end, she survived, but her child did not. Her health was deeply impacted and she struggled between two worlds for almost another year. Reco recovery required major surgery and a long convalescence, but she never forgot her promise. As soon as she could gather strength, she began to focus on restoration of the old graveyard. She started to research the old church records and record the names. Unfortunately, the local priest took a very difficult stance and obstructed any such effort. He declared that as a local woman, she was not qualified for such a task and university scholars were the only ones who could undertake this project. In addition, he insisted, the best way to restore the burial ground was to demolish everything and start from the beginning. And this is exactly what happened. Early one morning, a bulldozer drove straight into that graveyard. It dug a huge trench and then pushed all the headstones into the pit and covered it over. My mother only learned of this situation by chance as my father happened to drive past it on his way to work. He phoned her and she rushed down to the site, but it was too late. Standing by her side, we witnessed the final push as the bulldozer finished the job. We stood alone in an empty field now, I was 10 years old. 
my mother was devastated. But this was an era where to challenge the power of the church was to risk exclusion from the community. Her father <clears throat> implored her to quiet down and stop making such a fuss. So the entire matter was hushed over and put to rest, except in our house. As shocking as all this seems, my mother became the sole custodian of the only listing of those buried there, as all official records related to the graveyard disappeared. She had been granted a one night only reprieve by the priest to view those records in a moment of benevolence prior to the destruction. Painstakingly, all night long, she wrote out the names in longhand, and for years she kept that list close to her. As children, we were always aware of the importance of those papers. Throughout those years, her passion for the old graveyard never dimmed, until finally, over a decade later, she received an unexpected telephone call from a man named Martin Brown from Benasta, Quebec, another little village just up the road from Martindale. Martin wanted to talk to her about the graveyard. She didn't expect much from that meeting, but as it turned out, it was the beginning of something truly magnificent. Along with another local, Eddie McLaughlin, the trio launched a fundraising campaign to create a fitting memorial. By this time, the site had become a cow pasture with history covered over and a distant memory for many locals. With their support and enough money was finally raised in 1977 to put an impressive triple cenotaph in place. The memorial features a listing of all the names with the symbols of Ireland and Quebec, a Celtic cross, an Irish harp, and a fleur de lis. The site was now renamed Martindale Pioneer Cemetery. In our family, a lifetime of history took place between that remarkable event and the one that followed five years later. My mother had always envisioned a large Celtic cross to accompany the triple cenotaph. And again, along with the help of Martin, she was able to witness this become reality on September 19, 1982. Her friend, Belfast artist, Ethna O'Kane designed the imposing 12 foot high Celtic cross. Featured in the wheel of the cross is a ship depicting the voyage across the ocean. At the bottom is the image of a mother and father protectively holding the children in their arms. On either side are two brass plates inscribed in English, French, and Irish with the words of Gordon McLennan, a visiting professor from Donegal who met my mother while she was a student of the Irish language at the University of Ottawa. It reads, may the light of heaven shine on the souls of the Gales who left Ireland in the years of the great famine to find eternal rest in this soil. They will be remembered as long as love and music last. It was over 30 years later on September 18, 2016, almost to the day when the Celtic cross was unveiled but I was able to stand alongside my mother once again at Martindale Pioneer Cemetery for a joyful event that I shall never forget. The site had become a destination and over the years, countless visitors had stopped by to look up their ancestors listed on the monument, but the origin of the monument was unknown. And some wondered what happened to the original headstones in the cemetery? Martin and Eddie had now passed on and many others who contributed to the project had left the area. So my mother was there to acknowledge their work. We unveiled two plaques on either side of the monument with a listing of all those who had a role in its creation. That morning, over a hundred guests gathered to commemorate the occasion with mass at St. Martin's Church. My heart was filled with pride as my mother walked down the center aisle and the congregation rose in unison to clap their appreciation for her. Somehow, after all these years, it felt like redemption. There was a palpable sense of relief 
mixed with peace and serenity throughout the ceremony. After a morning of unrelenting downpours, the skies suddenly cleared and sunshine poured in through the stained glass windows. It was a day of heartfelt messages, of singing and laughter, of dancing and rain, and of solemn celebration. It was also a day to give thanks for this beautiful new homeland that gave us sustenance and hope for a ravaged people. Many came from far and wide that day to be present, and Jim Kelly, the newly arrived Irish ambassador to Canada at the time, was among the honored guests with his wife, Anne, and their two young daughters, Orla and Kira. In his short address, Ambassador Kelly noted that while he had been privileged to visit many Irish famine memorial sites in Ireland, in the United States, and elsewhere, he said the Martindale Pioneer Cemetery was one of the most impressive. When you look around at the beautiful Etno countryside here, it occurs to me that for those who survived the horrors of the Great Famine, there must perhaps have been small comfort in the familiarity of this beautiful countryside in what many of them would have known before in their life in Ireland. This was followed by my mother's emotional address where she said, I'm overjoyed to see the blessing of these plaques and it is most important to finally set the record straight for posterity. Today marks the culmination of what has become a lifetime of work for me at Martindale Pioneer Cemetery. Now, with this completed, I feel at this stage, it's time to pass the torch to the next generation. And I feel confident that it, it is now in capable hands. If I have any regrets, it's that Martin and Eddie are not here with me today, but I know they are here in spirit. One final comment for those of you who may not be aware. Following his role in Ottawa, Jim Kelly went on to serve as Ireland's Deputy Ambassador at the United Nations in New York City. And there was tremendous shock and outpouring of grief around the world when he passed away there very suddenly last March 18, 2021. In closing, I would like to thank all of you for hearing my story. And this remains very close to my heart. And I would like to mention that if any of you would like to learn more about this site, you can view the details online at martindalepioneercemetery.com. Now, I'd like to turn this over to my friend Una, who's going to read Dara's script as she is unable to join us today. Una? Thank you, uh, Maura. It's an honor to be able to read um, Dara's um, piece today. Unexpected and wonderful. <clears throat> it's March, 1957. My father, my sister and I are sailing away from Montreal to Ireland on a freighter, the Irish Pine. I am six years old and Roisin is 11. My father is a 44 year old man now and he is realizing his dream. He is going home. Tens of thousands of people were emigrating from Ireland to Canada in the 1950s, but my father was never one to swim with the tide. A family trait that he didn't, as the Irish say, lick off a stone. My mother had stayed behind in Montreal she will join us in five months in August after she finishes a course she is taking to become a certified medical records librarian. So she'll be able to get a good job in Ireland, just in case my father's plans don't work out. As the Irish pine passes Newfoundland, my father tells us about the new and prosperous life he will create for us in Ireland. In Ireland, people will recognize us for who we are. Roisin and I will go to the best schools. She is going to be a doctor or a veterinarian. 
I will become a famous Shakespearean actress, like my father's mother, my grandmother, Margaret, wanted to be, like Sarah Bernhardt. That's my father's pet name for her, Sarah Bernhardt. And pets, we are going to have lots of pets. I want a donkey. We are the only passengers on the Irish Pine. The crew builds a swing and a slide for us. The cook makes biscuits for us and he writes our names in Irish across the top with icing. My father tells us that the men work at sea for months on end, year after year. They miss their own children. That's why they were so delighted with Roisin and me. Sometimes our father would tell us stories about his mother's family, politicians, land leaguers, Irish members of parliament, suffragettes, Sinn Feiners, women going to universities, poets, actors, writers. And our father would tell us about his days supporting the anti-fascists in the Spanish Civil War organizing labor unions, running for mayor of Victoria. We ate our meals at the captain's table with the officers. After dinner, my father entertains everyone. Some nights he declaims patriotic speeches, like the one Robert Emmett gave from the dock in 1803, just before the British hanged him. The man lies, but his memory lives. I swear by the blood of the murdered patriots who have gone before me that the emancipation of my country will be accomplished. Sometimes he recites poetry. Yeats was his speciality. And walk among long dappled grass, and pluck till time and times are gone, the golden apples of the moon, the silver apples of the sun. Other evenings, my father led sing-alongs and his favorite song, I'm sure I won't do justice to this, Dara, <clears throat> only a lad of 18 summers, still there's no one can deny. Kevin Barry gave his young life in the case of liberty. Hmm. It's day five and we're halfway across the Atlantic. We're having dinner at the captain's table like we usually do. It's the soup course. The adults start talking about the war. The captain says, from my point of view, Hitler made one big mistake. He only killed six million Jews. He should have killed them all. My father banged his fist on the table. He leaps up. My wife is a Jew. My children are Jews. I will not listen to your murderous ignorance. You are a loathsome fool, a buffoon, a fascist. My father, my family fought for the Ireland free from bigotry and brutality. You are a disgrace to the Irish nation. The captain keeps eating. He's slurping his soup, dunking his bread. A fine fellow you are, Mr. Sheehy Culhane, but this is my ship and may my table and you and your Jewish children are no longer welcome. You will be confined to your cabin for the duration of the voyage. Get out of here before I have you taken out. My sister and I stand up and we follow our father. We march out of the captain's dining room and down to our cabin where we were locked in for seven days and seven nights. A crewman comes to let us out for one hour each day. 
and were allowed to walk on the lower deck until the first mate hollers, time's up. They bring us food three times a day, leftovers from the crew's meals. It's a very different food from what we ate at the captain's table. A few times when we come back to our cabin after our hour on the lower deck, we find giant biscuits wrapped in a tea towel waiting for us on our bunks. Our names are written across the top in Irish with icing. Once there is a steak and a glass of whiskey waiting for my father too. We aren't allowed to use the bathroom down the hall. We have to go in a bucket. My father tells us to pretend we're in a play and to make believe that we don't see or hear or smell each other when we're using the bucket. That's very hard to do. My father was really, has really changed. He's in a rage all the time and he broods. We finish reading Alice in Wonderland and Ulysses, but it isn't fun anymore. The Queen of Hearts sets him off on tangents about British imperialism, 800 years of colonialism, the authoritarian personality type that fascism and Catholicism breeds, and Irish people who can now only imagine choosing between two masters, the Queen or the Pope. The tap, tap, tap of Leopold Bloom's walking stick on the cobblestones of Dublin evokes rants about why Joyce and Wilde and Shaw left the country and how his own mother was driven out by her own kind. He quotes Joyce, Ireland is an old sow who eats her farrow. Finally, we land in Yall County, Cork, and we alight from the lower deck released from the Irish pine. My father wraps his arms around Roisin and me and holds us so tight we can hardly breathe. Tears stream down my father's cheeks. We are home, my darling girls. We are now home. Thank you, Dar.